cybersecurity and cyber law. Um, we want to start by acknowledging that Harvard is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Our guests today yeah. are two friends and colleagues of ours, Dr. Laura and Mr. Plunkett. Doc is a law professor and, a direct, and the director of the Digital Law Center at the University of Geneva. And Leah is the assistant dean for learning experience and technology and the Meyer Research Lecturer on Law at Harvard Law School. They're here to illuminate big picture challenges around data governance and altruistic data sharing models. The EU Data Governance Act describes, quote, data altruism, unquote, as when individuals and companies give their consent or permission to make available data that they generate voluntarily and without reward to be used in the public interest. So we will dive deep into the specific realities of this model for children and teenagers, both in everyday and in crisis contexts. Please note that this event is being recorded. There are some cameras in the ceilings. Um, however, audience members will not be shown. Um, for the virtual audience, if you uh, wish to ask any questions or leave any comments, please use the question and answer function on Zoom. And this is also a friendly reminder to ensure that your mics are muted during the event and for folks in the room to quiet your phones, please. Um, we strive to create inclusive, accessible events. For any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas for future gatherings, please contact us at events at cyber.harvard.edu. Your feedback is critical to our success. And to stay in the loop about future events at the Berkman Klein Center, head to cyber.harvard.edu slash get involved. Um, and for students, I know there are a lot of students in the room. We have a student, Harvard student specific um, listserv as well that you can sign up for to learn about those kinds of opportunities here at Center as well. Um, thank you for joining us today. And Jacques and Leah, take it away. Thank you so much, Becca. It is wonderful to be here and wonderful to welcome you back to Cambridge. We miss having you here in person last January when you were teaching online as a visiting professor and delighted you are here now. So warm welcome. And with that, I may actually put you on the hot seat and ask you a question about life across the pond. And my question is this, data altruism, could you tell us a little bit more about how it is defined as a legal term of art over in Europe, as well as from a policy perspective? What does it mean as a US-based lawyer and legal scholar and US-based data subjects? Data altruism sounds delightful, <laughs> but what does it mean? So first of all, thank you very much. It's an immense pleasure for me to be back um, in person, also with the wonderful weather and to discover the new uh, uh, Berkman Klein uh, Center uh, office space. Okay. It would not be a tech-related discussion without a tech-related moment. All that is that all. Yeah, that should work better this time. Um, so, um, as mentioned by Becca in the introduction, so we are basically uh, exploring and having to discover what uh, this concept of data altruism is supposed to mean. Uh, it has been now adopted in the Data Governance Act that will come into force uh, in less than a year from now, in September 2023. Um, the regulation has been uh, adopted back in May, so we'll have to see what that means. And uh, when I perhaps want to do from the outset is just describe a bit what that means without going too much into the details, perhaps we'll keep, keep that for the uh, subsequent set of the discussion and also to try to keep it at a high level. So as mentioned, one key element is that data address relies on the voluntary process, so it's based on consent. Uh, and also one important element is to keep in mind that data address does not focus only on personal data, under the famous uh, GDPR, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but also covers non-personal data. So I mean, industrial data, that means also you can have uh, potentially companies or individuals sharing their non-personal data 
and that can be part of data altruism. Uh, one thing which is important, and Becca, you already alluded to that, is that if we want to speak about data altruism, there should be no remuneration. Uh, so the, the person and the company sharing the data in the context of data altruism activities shall not be remunerated for that, except for covering the cost. The question is, what does that mean to cover the cost? But anyway, there shall be no basically uh, financial interest in incentives for sharing. But more importantly, and perhaps most importantly, in order to speak about data altruism, uh, the sharing must be done for a purpose of general interest. And there are a few examples which are, are given in the Data Governance Act. Uh, that can be promotion of mobility, promotion of environmental purpose, also research purposes. Uh, there are a few examples which are given, uh, which uh, mean basically that there shall be, of course, uh, not a commercial setting, not a commercial purpose for that data sharing. And one key element, and I insist on that, is that it is really based on consent, meaning that, and perhaps also a weakness of the entire system is that the consent can be withdrawn. So there is a dependency on concept, uh, on the consent, which is at the core of the data altruism uh, mechanism. And one thing which is, of course, important to keep in mind too, is that in Europe, but also in other places, uh, no one basically waited for the Data Governance Act to do some data altruism activities, and there are plenty of examples uh, of such activities. Uh, for instance, the city of Barcelona, where basically they had launched a project called Decode, in which people were invited to set sensors uh, for the purpose of collecting data for uh, air pollution measures, measures on, on this type of activity. So that means we will have a new framework, uh, which basically should facilitate, and that's going to be part of the discussion, um, but which certainly doesn't create uh, data altruism as such from scratch, it has been uh, in the air for some time. So that's basically the what is data altruism. Um, if I may just briefly turn to the who, so who shall be uh, doing that? So there are, as you could expect, so-called data altruism organization that are to be uh, governed by this Data Governance Act, they should be and they shall be, um, this is a mandatory uh, obligation, non-for-profit organization. They shall also do business in a manner which is totally separated from for business entities. So if there is a business entity uh, which may want to engage in data uh, altruism activity, they, they should create some kind of independent, perhaps a foundation or another non-for-profit institution in order to run that. And um, the EU framework somehow um, is based on some kind of incentive system, and we'll get to see whether that will work and whether the incentives are, are, are quite efficient or not, in the sense that there is a system by which these data altruism organization may get registered at the national level in registry for data altruism organization, and uh, there is no obligation to do so, but if they do so, there is an incentive, again, with the question whether that would be uh, effective or not, that they will be in a position to use a label, and that label will be uh, data organization which are recognized in the union, so the kind of a certification, meaning that they are trustworthy partners, and that's, I guess, the essence of the discussion. How do we create trust? How will we make uh, sure that the system works in the sense that we, people and company will do and engage in data and tourism activity? So there's labeling system, and as you could expect, uh, there is also some kind of a supervision system by state authorities in order to make sure that those companies who wants to deserve that label do comply with the relevant obligation. So that would be the who, so would be data uh, altruism organization and some kind of a supervisory system at the national level. And now as to the how, also very briefly, um, so one thing that somehow transpires, so to say, from the regulation, and again, uh, I could have mentioned that from the outset, of course, from observing from the outside uh, of the EU being based in, in, in Switzerland. But one thing that transpires from the regulation is that there is a strong um, intent of the regulator to make sure that the data shall not be misused. So there are a lot of publications which are imposed on these data altruism organization in order to make sure that they do protect 
also in terms of cybersecurity and connected to the events today, uh, make sure that there shall be no leakage and that there is a strong obligation to protect the data that they get access to uh, that are granted um, to them by these data owners. Now, one important piece also of the regulation is a so-called rule book. So there shall be a rule book that shall be established by the EU Commission in the coming times that shall somehow define what are supposed to be the obligation or, of the data uh, altruism organization, which will be a very important uh, way to implement that in practice. And that rule book, interestingly, will also have to raise awareness about data altruism. So that's also a question of as we um, discussed in preparation of the session, how do we incentivize the people basically to share the data? So the rule book will be an important uh, element of implementation as to the how that shall work, hopefully. Another very important document will be the so-called European Data Altruism Consent Form. Um, as mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the entire system is based on consent. And the uh, idea is to create trust so that people who will be uh, would have the required level of trust in order to untrust the data to third parties on, on an altruistic basis. So there shall be some kind of a uniform format to do so uh, in the way of, of a form that shall be developed at, at a, a subsequent stage. Now, in terms of policy action, that's going to be my final report on that. Uh, if you look at the regulation, you'll see that there is a mention of the potential development, it's not mandatory, but a potential development of so-called uh, national data policies. So it'll be interesting also to see uh, what will come on that front and perhaps in terms of future academic uh, policy work, whether there might be support to be offered on that basis, perhaps from a transatlantic perspective to see uh, how this national um, data uh, altruism policy shall, shall be uh, implemented in, in practice. Another question, of course, as we discuss is to see how this type of evolution, how this type of regulatory approach um, might have a success even beyond the European Union as far as Switzerland is concerned, even though um, I'm, of course it's too early somehow to predict whether that will be implemented in Switzerland, but I'm pretty sure that we are of course observing that very closely uh, because as a matter of principle, we're trying to be EU compliant um, uh, as a matter of principle, not only for data policies, but more generally. So I'm sure that this will have an impact, but the question is perhaps turning to you is to, to think about how uh, that type of regulatory model uh, might uh, be uh, perceived as a potential model in the same way as the GDPR, of course, in a different but slightly connected, of course, matter, the GDPR has uh, been set to uh, kind of have become some kind of a global standard uh, with respect to data protection. So what do you think uh, of uh, the Data Governance Act as uh, to the data altruism uh, option? Thank you so much. And if it's working okay, if I say, okay, just a quick touch up before I talk about tech. So here in the United States, since we don't have the same type of national, or in the case of GDPR, supra national data privacy protections and data governance framework, we have a long way to go. First, I think to serve as a model in the United States, we would need to get ourselves a comprehensive federal privacy law, where regardless of whether you are living in California, which has really our strongest state level data privacy protections in the country at this point, or whether you are living in a state that doesn't have that, you, no matter what your age is, can rest assured that there are certain rights that you have in your data that are not going to be violated regardless of where you're living. So I think it's it's hard to get to a concept of data altruism yet in the United States because altruism implies that it is yours to share. And while I am very much committed to the principle that all of us as individuals do have more rights in our data than our country's law currently recognizes. The fact remains that on a federal level, actually those rights are not protected. So it's hard to think about 
how you find your way to being altruistic, to sharing, to giving something that the law does not yet fully recognize as yours. Second, I think that there is a trust issue in the United States with the idea that big data can do big good. <laughs> Certainly, we have many cases, and Jack, you and a number of colleagues wrote a wonderful recent paper that was circulated in connection with this talk about all the ways, especially in crisis mode, that data sharing can facilitate absolutely life-saving forms of good, but unfortunately, as a research, recent Pew research study here in the United States found, it was almost roughly 80% of adults surveyed have some level of concern about their data privacy in this country. And so before we can get comfortable thinking that we could share voluntarily and transparently for a greater good, we have to not only have legal confidence that the data is somehow ours or somehow protected, but also we need demonstrated use cases where it is being used in our own good. And last but certainly not least, I think those two issues are particularly important when it comes to youth. And I am defining youth here broadly to include folks in that sort of 21 and under range. There are other ways that one could draw those lines, but I am going a little bit younger with that group to say that youth are born digital, as our colleagues Oris Gasser and John Palfrey have been, been saying for, for quite a while. And so when you are talking about now generations, not just a generation, but generations that even before they are born in some instances, and for some of them, you could argue even before conception, if data from a fertility tracking app or wearable device could be linked back to them, their whole coming into existence actually has a digital data trail. And I think that for generations that are born and conceived, maybe even thought of, I don't know, folks who are technologists can jump in and tell me we have the technology that can read our minds that I don't know about yet. And please, by the way, if you have questions in the audience or out there virtually, just jump in at any point. But I think that there needs to be an even greater emphasis placed on that trust building and proof of concept for data altruism to take hold in the United States, especially among youth. And I'd be curious to hear a little bit more of, of your reflection, reflection, Jacques, on when we look over and think about how that kind of trust may be built up even better right now in the EU and other European but non-EU countries, how do you think about that relationship between privacy protections and trust building such that countries can find their way to data altruism? I, I think um, it's, it's, of course, a key element that as we just discussed is try to see how we, you can ingrain somehow trust in the entire ecosystem of, of uh, data altruism. And, um, one thing that we can note when we look uh, at uh, at this data governance act with respect to the specific chapter on data risk and have some kind of helicopter view uh, is that uh, there is still uh, basically a, a system which is anchored on consent as, as the key uh, element which is supposed to justify the entire system. And you kindly alluded to that uh, recent uh, position paper that we have uh, uh, drafted in an interdisciplinary way on, on using or improving and maximizing the use of data in crisis situations. In that concept paper, we have somehow moved away from consent in order to find other grounds which would make it possible to use data. So to me, the question is, do we want to keep that regulatory model which is based on consent, which is now what is at the core of the Digital Governance Act, um, which is of course the um, kind of the, the logical consequence of considering data rights as individual rights, at least with respect to personal data protection, or do we want to move away from that paradigm, also knowing that if we, and that's a general reflection, which is also uh, actually mentioned in the Data Governance Act, um, 
individual data that we collect from yourself or myself will, of course, have no impact. That might come uh, and might help if we collect all our data in this room and, of course, way beyond this room, perhaps also with our online colleagues, and that can have an impact. So my point is that we have to think, perhaps, in terms of partnership from individual exercise to collective exercise. And that's and if we want to do that transition somehow, of course, if we consider this is legitimate, we may also have to think about moving from individual consent to perhaps collective consent or no consent, but other legitimate basis for processing data. And um, uh, there are critical voices which have uh, been uh, uh, criticizing even quite heavily this data governance act on the ground that precisely it's based on consent and I terminate on that um, also because if you go through that document you will see that there is pretty strong insistence not only on consent as the justification for processing and for data addressing but also and that's a logical consequence uh, for withdrawal of consent another question uh, is what do you do if people withdraw the consent, that would mean potentially down the road that the use for the public interest might be threatened uh, in the future if people do withdraw the consent. So we have a problem, which is a general problem under data protection law, but also personal data protection law, but also for non-personal data. If it's uh, from an IP perspective, I may just make a very uh, short side note on that. It's as if you have a license agreement and then you terminate the license agreement. Of course, the licensee after the termination doesn't have any right to use anymore. And that would be the consequence here. Is it really what we want in terms of uh, general interest, general public interest that Everyone can basically individually withdraw the consent. And also in very practical terms, I don't think that would be easy to implement because if we assume, and I'll terminate on that, if we assume that the value of data is basically the collectivization, collectivization of data, the aggregation of data, what, how do you, um, in practical terms, implement a withdrawal? knowing that the data will be basically commingled and mixed with other data. That means in practical terms, my perception that would be in any manner extremely difficult to enforce this withdrawal of consent. So question to me is, is it still the right model? And I'd be, of course, very happy to hear you, but perhaps also the audience as to what might be the appropriate model um, to move away from this consent-based individually exercised uh, rights to a collective uh, exercise of rights, which perhaps might be based on collective interests and say, this is legitimate for society. We need more data address. So we need somehow to, to kind of find a legal basis to justify this type of data processing. I see a hand back there. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I have a question. So this is very interesting. So I may need two parts to my question. The first thing is, so altruism has a very positive connotation to it, right? And sometimes individual interests are in conflict with collective interests. Um, Thank you. Um, so, so there may be a conflict between individual and collective interests, and so maybe it's not the best for the individual to sign up for, for that, right? So um, what, what are the downsides? And then the second aspect I want to talk about, uh, but like you to ask about is um, nudging or like consent. You talk about consent. There's a lot of research in my field, which is information systems management about algorithmic nudging, which refers to the use of um, psychological cues to make people behave in a way that may not always be good for them, right? So um, yes, consent is fine, but maybe they are nudged into something that is not good for them. And is that still then something that is altruistic or good? Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for these points, which are uh, of course of key, of key relevance. My perception is that um, even if we were to move away from individual consent and have some kind of another justification, what should remain is full information. And you see that also transpire in, in the regulation, which is kind of a standard approach, which certainly makes sense to make sure that, to your point, there's really a, a full information as to what shall happen with the relevant data, also to prevent that the 
the type of general uh, public um, activities that were supposed to be covered and that were supposed to be undertaken on the basis of the consent that was initially given that these general uh, public interest activities shall not be converted subsequently into perhaps commercial activities. So there's really a need to make sure that you have a, a fully informed consent, or even if we were to move away from, from individual consent, we would still have some kind of a full disclosure as to, as to what happens. Now, in, in terms of the nudging, and I'm not familiar necessarily with what you're doing in terms of research, I'd be very interested, by the way, to also to learn more. Um, uh, it's certainly something that would also need to be uh, taken into um, account in the sense that we should, again, I guess that could be connected also to this full disclosure, full information to, to be given to make sure there is no kind of misleading. And you see that also, um, and I'll terminate on that. You see that in the regulation, there are also some kind of uh, protection mechanism in order to avoid that allegedly um, uh, altruistic activities uh, and organization shall kind of um, make like misleading statements in order to attract data and to collect them for commercial purposes. So there's this tension somehow to make sure that if it is truly altruistic, the entities which are engaged in this type of activities should really make sure that there's no uh, misleading of these data providers in any manner. Consent is a really tricky concept, and I see a hand, so I'll keep this very brief. I just wanted to surface, and I would love questions, reflections, pushback on what I'm about to say. I think consent is so tricky right now, especially in the United States. And here I'm talking specifically about consent when it comes to digital data, that we should, and I you should from both an ethical and also legal basis, we should get consent from a data subject, from a person before using their data. Practically speaking, in the United States, the vast, 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 vast majority of the time that we are theoretically giving our consent, it's really not consent in a practical sense. So think about all the times you are clicking I agree or swiping next or hitting submit. You probably aren't reading everything that you are theoretically consenting to. And I'm not faulting you for that. I will fully confess if it is in my professional capacity or it involves my kids, I am reading it. If it is just in my personal capacity and just about me and I'm trying to get you know, my Uber app updated, I am definitely not reading it because I've got a million other things to do. And so the whole framework we have going on right now around consent in the United States and there's a lot of legal fiction to it in a way that I really struggle with in terms of thinking about how to build a fair and inclusive and just common sense, honest digital data governance system in this country when we keep talking about consent and it's ultimately pretty empty in terms of building upon it. There's a great recent law review article by a law professor named Mary Fan that talks about, and I believe it's the first of its kind in the United States to affirmatively talk about building a public or collective right to pool data in a data altruistic way in order to have shared public benefits. So thinking a little bit about some of the rights that might exist in terms of public access may be a way here in the United States, as well as across the pond, to make our way through a little bit of this, I would say, legal fiction in our country, at least, that it's possible to have actual consent. And I saw your hand. I don't want to cut you. Did I see it correctly? Please. Mine is a very basic question. In Wikipedia, we find biographical information of many scientists and artist. So I'm a plant biologist and I do provide data both of living and even the past. About three or four years ago, I heard that what we provide may not agree, may be in violation of the privacy of European Union. And so can you elaborate anything about it? I'm not sure I got the question right. Perhaps could you? Rephrase it. Um, 
I think oh. the question, and please jump in if I if I misheard. I think the question has to do with. I think the question has to do with the ways in which GDPR over in in the EU may be impacting the ability for a scientist to share information on Wikipedia or other platforms. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I mean, I would not be in a position to speak specifically with respect to Wikipedia, but as a matter of principle, I think, and I just had a doctoral student who written a, a her PhD thesis on that topic. Um, uh, and if I put it in general terms, um, the challenge is to make sure that GDPR doesn't prevent academic research and research activity in general. And you see that also coming back to the topic of today's session, you see that emerging too with respect to data at risk because uh, research and scientific activities are one of the activities which are supposed to be covered uh, by this uh, general public interest that could justify data at risk activities. So there's a tension uh, which still exists and on which I think we still should work collectively uh, in order to make sure that GDPR doesn't uh, act somehow as a barrier and a, as a hurdle for scientific activities uh, in, in the broader sense. So that's certainly a, a very uh, relevant uh, concern and a very important issue. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I I agree with this idea that we need more uh, collective measures for consent to uh, for data processing, and I'm interested in if you thought about you know concrete measures how to uh, effectively democratize uh, data processing, and if you also thought about specific use cases or something that you could share with us. Yeah, thanks very much. It's a very important point, and I think I was uh, thinking also in terms of incentives in order to try to promote data altruism. I think what we need is precisely case studies. And I'm thinking perhaps also a comment or question to, to you, Leah, as to what should the next gens do? How we can incentivize them to share the data? Um, we, this not necessarily with this type of relatively, let's say, regulated approach uh, where we define what uh, data altruism organization are supposed to do or what not supposed to do we have to find uh, ways to incentivize the sources of the data uh, and and um, as mentioned there are a few examples perhaps we can share the uh, paper that we've discussed in, the, in, uh, in preparation of the session there was for instance this decode project uh, of uh, which was conducted as i was mentioning earlier by the city of barcelona and i guess you can look it up uh, online that's an interesting example and and you'll see also that's one of the tricky question at the eu level is how do you distinguish between personal data on the one hand and non-personal data which is frequently quite tricky, which is why I think it's good that this um, new Data Governance Act in terms of data altruism adopts a transversal approach saying that uh, this data altruism rules are supposed and can apply to any kind of data, basically. I think now as to the first part of your uh, point <clears throat> in terms of collective uh, collectivization, if you look here again at another chapter of the Data Governance Acts, what they are contemplating and what will have to be implemented in the near future is uh, the creation of so-called data intermediaries. So data intermediaries, as the name indicates, are supposed to act as entities between data holders on the one hand and data users on the other hand. So it's one step in the direction of trying to move away from the individual exercise of data rights to a more collective exercise. But here again, and that's a different chapter, perhaps a different discussion, um, we have to see how that can be implemented. I think one point that will have to be taken into account in this discussion of fostering this data intermediation services is to make sure that we find the right balance in terms of risk of liability uh, of these data intermediaries. So they will be basically getting a lot of data and then they will kind of sub-license them out using again an, an IP licensing terminology to third parties. We just have to make sure that they don't risk too much because they will not be at the source of the data. So they will help in the process, but to me, it might be kind of unfair to have a strict standard liability because otherwise, ultimately, you have no one uh, providing data intermediary services. And 
the reason why I'm mentioning is that is that you may have the same type of concern or policy risk if you think about data altruism mobilization, which may also, in certain circumstances, act as data intermediaries uh, by which they would collect uh, these data for altruistic purposes and then sub-license them out. Here again, we just have to make sure that the system uh, finds an appropriate balance of, of rights and interests to make sure that the system works uh, to move away from individual exercise to collective exercise, if that answers your question. Do we have any questions on that? Oh, I see one in the back and then also if we have uh, folks joining us from home, we'd love to hear from you as well. Thanks so much. I wonder if you might just spend a, a brief moment expanding on the intermediary concept you just introduced specifically with respect to some of the work done by uh, people here, among others, regarding data fiduciaries and borrowing specifically the obligations, both legal and normative, surrounding fiduciaries for, for example, financial data, medical data, et cetera. It sounds like you're proposing something a little broader, but I wonder if you might uh, go into a little more detail, please. So, uh, let me return the question. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and perhaps your definition of, of uh, data fiduciaries with which I'm not as familiar. Uh, to be frank, I'm looking at, I have uh, taken a copy of the Data Governance Act because there's a, a full chapter on data intermediaries and uh, which defines all the rights and obligations of, of these platforms. To me, uh, if I may give also perhaps knowing or thinking that I know, I'm not sure this is the case, uh, past activities here at the Bookman Client Center in terms of intermediary liability for uh, in the digital environment. Um, uh, my perception is that as I was uh, perhaps mentioning earlier, is that this new emerging um, concept of data intermediaries doesn't necessarily fit in what we've discussed so far in terms of risk of liability. It's not something which is somehow associated, for instance, with the intermediary liability with respect to copyright infringement, for which, as you know, there's been a lot going on, on in all parts of the world, including in Europe. Here we have to deal with something which, which is new, which is somehow, um, and I'm well aware that I don't fully answer your question, uh, but uh, I think this somehow one uh, evidence among others of uh, perhaps the fragmented approach uh, that you can find in, in various um, let's say activities of regulators and specifically also at the EU level. Um, in a nutshell, I don't think these are the same people basically uh, who have drafted uh, this data governance act by comparison to other well identified and well established uh, issues that we may face with respect, for instance, to copyright infringement in the digital environment. But again, I'd be also very interested now or later to uh, have a sense of uh, this data fiduciary um, and intermediary, uh, um, fiduciary intermediaries that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, we've got this one, and then I know that there's at least one in, in uh, the Zoom. Hi, thanks a lot for this. I'm wondering whether you think that the Digital Governance Act's chapter on data intermediaries might facilitate the emergence of data markets? And if so, what effect do you think that would have on data governance in general? Again, I'm, I'm not reading the crystal ball, but um, this is the ambition, I guess, uh, precisely to, to foster, and that's, as you know, one of the many facets of uh, European data strategy. Um, but but the, the question is to see also how we would um, reduce transaction costs to some extent, uh, to make sure that there are sufficient incentives from the source of the data to make this data available to the data intermediaries and in turn from the data intermediaries so that they can make the data available to interested uh, end, end users. And to me, uh, that also requires, um, like for any market, that uh, the transaction costs shall be reduced. So that means also in practical terms that there should be some kind of template agreement on the basis of which uh, you can rely uh, on, on a system which works and it is easy to implement to make sure you can get access to data or respectively you can grant access to your own uh, data. 
And one final element in, in that respect uh, on which I think it's important also to, to focus in this general framework of creating, as you say, and this is a key element, creating uh, data markets, is to make sure that if there is a dispute, these disputes are solved uh, efficiently and uh, to make sure that you have a system by which, um, and I'm not too sure in that respect, that uh, a strong state intervention is necessarily relevant. Perhaps we, we should think about alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to make sure that there is a, like a speedy, uh, accessible also in terms of cost process by which you would manage potential disputes that may arise between the stakeholders. I may offer two very quick observations. Um, I think, I think I'm good for a moment, and then I would love to hear from the question coming in at home. You sort of maybe tie the last two wonderful reflections and questions together. The first is, in my understanding, and I will, I will of course, defer to our, our colleague across the pond if I'm missing something, but I would read the data intermediary chapter in the new Data Governance Act, as well as the um, recitals ahead of it that support it, as being less directive and requiring less of a duty toward a data subject than the data fiduciary model would. I would broadly understand data intermediaries as being required to engage in a somewhat enhanced level of responsibility with much more oversight than we currently have for the data broker model in the United States, which is just completely the wild west, but not nearly as much as a true fiduciary would somebody who really has a directive to act in your best interest to be loyal to you and to not interject their own interests into their decision making. Last quick reflection on the effectively the data market model we have in the United States, which has a number of different stakeholders, but is powered disproportionately by private data brokers that are quite in some ways a shadow market, even though they are big business. And I'd say they are a shadow market because they are very loosely regulated at best. More probably, it would be fair to say they're largely unregulated. There has been some movement at state and federal levels to rein that in, but data brokers in the United States engage in a robust data market business where they are aggregating, analyzing, resharing, and repurposing data that very often all of us don't even realize they have in ways and with organizations that we don't know they are contracting with. And unfortunately, we do see that organizations in the United States that we would consider altruistic and are altruistic also do engage with data brokers. One quick example that I will welcome our, our virtual participant. There was a great study by the Center for Law and Information Policy CLIP at Fordham Law School back in, I think, roughly 2018 that looked specifically at how data brokers were getting information about youth. They thought largely through school settings and they featured a piece of data in that report that the American Red Cross had gotten information about potential blood donors using data broker available lists or selects, which are subsets of lists. I am not critiquing the American Red Cross or their desire to find blood donors. I am just flagging that already in the United States, we do have these very unregulated, very shadowy data markets that exist with data brokers. So with that, um, our virtual friend. Great, thank you. Um, so good transition to, there's a couple questions in here, but I'll start with this. Will youth have the legal agency to assert authority over their data management? Um, might that sovereignty extend to even govern their parents' ability to control it? I Love that question. And whoever asked it, I promise it wasn't a plant. So we are in a, <laughs> unless it was, I can't see who it was, but I, I didn't consciously plant it. So we are in a very exciting and also very open time with this new governance act in the EU because it has been passed. It is not yet effective. And there is much to be seen and much to be created about filling in the details and implementation. I think that it is an open question, just what relationship youth 
will have if they have not attained the relevant age of legal majority for that purpose. And especially if there were to be a some sort of conflict, to use the term that was, was used by the question, who would be who would be the sovereign? Who would trump? Would it be the youth or would it be their parent? or guardian. We are in an open space around that. My guess, unfortunately, is that it's likely to default to parent or guardian. Laws typically do when it comes to youth and data, and I really do question whether that is always desirable, but I would be curious to hear, Jacques, your, your take on this particular set of questions as we move from the passage to the effective date in 2023 of the Data Governance Act. How do you see this and maybe some of the related questions unfolding? And then I know we have folks waiting in our virtual queue. Yeah, I think um, that's um, also quite intriguing um, area uh, of, of policy attention. And that would depend if I try to make a reasoning at least based on Swiss law and subject to a more detailed and in-depth analysis under EU law, my perception is that that may depend on local laws because it's basically an issue of civil law. To what extent minors can consent or not, and if yes, to what extent, to something which is relevant to their own, let's say, intangible assets or which is very adequate now for focusing on personal data. Um, so I don't think there is necessarily a EU-wide uh, solution, at least there is as far as I can tell, no international solution, uh, which is uh, um, like um, unanimous. Uh, but um, if we were to think about a, a way to kind of promote uh, data altruism uh, also for the future and also to empower uh, minors to engage in these type of activities, we may think about alleviating perhaps the conditions and to give them more power perhaps by standard, by comparison to other classical issue for which, as you were saying, parents may have more power to decide. Uh, but to me, that would also, of course, imply that there is an even more um, detailed, perhaps, information, if not consent, to make sure that they get a very, very clear picture, perhaps in simplified manner, but of course, truthful and adequate manner as to what shall happen. But also, and perhaps more importantly, to motivate them to engage in this type of activities and coming back to the question earlier as, as to the case studies to show impact to say look uh, speaking to teenagers uh, you may have the possibility to share data for I don't know mobility for uh, in terms of energetic consumptions or but that should be based and perhaps there are technological solutions to that perhaps connected to an app which could show look by what you share today you have contributed perhaps even a very minor points even not a percentage but still this is what it, this is the output of what you're doing of your contributing to do so if we were uh, in a position of ensuring that there is transparency sufficient level of information i would personally but i cannot speak for regulators i would personally uh, be quite interested to see is there's a bit more freedom to make it possible for minors to engage in a non-commercial and to promote a non-commercial use of their data and specifically uh, to engage into data altruism activities. And I think it would be interesting to see in this interesting period that we have, my perhaps concern is that it may depend again on like quite fundamental uh, principles of private law, civil law, family law potentially to see to what extent minors do have that level of freedom or not. And that's of course open for discussion. Well, that leads into, these are nice little ping pongs back and forth. Um, a question here where it notes uh, that altruism feels more individual instead of doing something for the social good or in the name of the public interest, getting to the incentives. What are the limitations to the concept of altruism? Um, and is it possible to think about data sharing as part of a duty so that bigger problems can be solved. Um, of course, the duty to share would not be without safeguards, for example, privacy. One of the things, thank you. So there is this concept in the Data Governance Act about how altruistic purposes need to serve the objective or an objective of general interest. 
And so there is a way in which already, at least on its face, the Data Governance Act is saying that altruism ultimately has to move toward this objective or an objective of general interest. I think that does open up ways to think about and perhaps to design implementing regulations and structures that do point more in the direction of having some sort of obligation or civic duty or collective action that would move us toward this being less of an individual decision which then would add up, as you were pointing out earlier, Jacques, to some, some real problems of individual consent were withdrawn to some sort of obligation. I will say that I think in the United States, at least, that would require a lot of trust building and proof of concept because they're not always, but there's a lot of sentiment, I think, justified that all of us in the United States have become at times and often unwittingly participants in a system where we are giving up large amounts of personal data all the time in exchange for free or lower cost digital services or devices. So we sort of feel like we've already been entered into that model in this country and that we don't necessarily have a lot to show for it. And, and again, I, I do understand that the, the vision across the pond is specifically to make sure that if data is being given in this altruistic way, that it is going to these non-commercial purposes of, of general interest, but just flagging in the United States that figuring out how to design some sort of duty or obligation, or perhaps you could also look at it as Professor Fan does, which is a public right to have access to this information once it's generated, we have a little bit of a ways to go. So I, I think quick reaction on that. Um, I think if, if, as we discussed altruism, may be perceived so far as kind of a individual behavior and decision, uh, but data altruism must be collective for the reason that we've discussed. If just only single person doing that, there's no way that will lead to any impactful uh, outcome. Uh, now, if we just perhaps take a step back and even bigger picture, this is not very far as far as I can see from other, let's say, societal uh, engagements of citizens in promoting, um, let's say, scientific interests. So like citizen science um, uh, and, and these type of movements or perhaps crowdfunding or crowd, crowd contribution to the advancements of science. To me, this is somehow also connected to what we're discussing here, more specifically in terms of data altruism. And I think um, there are, um, there's a, obviously, as we discussed, a very important need to try to identify what shall be kind uh, the ways how you can leverage that and can promote that, including or thinking when I was listening to what you just said, also in terms of education. Uh, what if schools were to promote actively uh, this type of data altruism activities, of course, with the limits that we've defined, uh, or what if other institutions would, would try to do that, again, with uh, the the a system which would preserve uh, and protect transparency, make sure there's full disclosure as to what is done, but also which shows the outcome and the potential impact of, of the potential data sharing activities. Okay, we've got one more question. Um, so what about people whose data is linked with other folks' data? Um, how do we deal with sort of the ways in which it becomes heterogeneous and how does somebody altruistically um, give rights to that or not? I think, yeah, to me, um, one aspect of this tricky question relates to, as I was mentioning earlier, to the consequences of a withdrawal. So given that uh, the fate of the data that is supposed to be shared based on Altruist uh, data sharing is that it shall be combined with other data. Um, I think it will be very difficult to come back. So ultimately, even if theoretically there might be a right of withdrawal, it's quite uncertain how that would work, which is why, again, if we look 
at what has been contemplated and what will have to be implemented at your level. It will be uh, interesting to see how uh, this will be drafted, including in the standard content form that is supposed to be to be um, drafted in the future. I suspect there will be a very big gap, as there often is, between what is on paper and what is done in practice. On paper, under the Data Governance Act, data is any digital representation of acts, facts, or information, including a compilation of those types of acts, facts, and information. So on paper, Sure, I can revoke my consent, but if the data that I have supplied in that digital representation includes acts and facts and information that also has data about folks who actually not only did not withdraw their consent, but affirmatively wish to be part of this data altruism experience, that is going to have to get sorted out in this year-long space and beyond. And my guess is in practice, no matter what the on paper resolution is, we are going to have a situation where either too much data is being withdrawn because it is intermingled and someone revokes consent and you sort of cut with a shovel rather than a scalpel, or we are going to wind up under removing and the the person whose data is requested to be withdrawn, it won't get withdrawn because it will say, well, actually it's part of somebody else's compilation of digital information. And for folks who want further reading, Alicia Solo Niederman, who used to be at HLS and is now at Iowa, is doing wonderful legal scholarship here in the United States about these exactly these types of group life realities and the ways in which our current approach to data governance and privacy law does not fit the realities of group data sets and how all of our lives at this point are very much networked and that the ability to give or revoke consent individually does have implications for the folks around you. And with that, are we at time or? Okay, thank you all so, so much. This has been delightful, Jacques, always a pleasure. We hope you will come back and see us again soon. And for everybody here at BKC, to our wonderful events team, to our wonderful attendees and our wonderful folks on the other side of the screen, it is always a delight to engage on these tricky and exciting topics with you. Thank you so much. Merci. Thank you, Bobo.